our recording. All right, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's kick this meeting off with our vision. Um, and, and Stephanie, I don't know if the goals have been finalized for next year. Is that is that published? Is, are they still talking about it? Do you know the goals for town manager goals? <laughs> oh, I um I think they did. I, I think they were adopted one or two meetings ago, but they are okay. in the the council has um on the council page. You should be able to access them. Okay, I'll take a look at it because I'll have to change this. All right, so I mean everybody's aware of our vision, right? I mean we want to work collaboratively with the town and community, but uh, our goals will change, so I'll take a look at them and uh, uh, modify these for our next meeting. Um, in terms of our execution pillars, it continues to stay the same. Um, our metrics, so the, my metrics here, and I, I talked to Stella separately, we were talking about transportation, and Stella, if you feel like there are some metrics here that you wanna add for transportation, please let me know. And I'd say the same for everybody else as well, uh, for each of your pillars. Um, our community participation has been dwindling. We had five people last time. Um, so I know we're having the transportation education series today. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have a um, improved participation today, but I also wanna make sure that we're uh, sending these flyers out ahead of time um to our network so they we give them enough time to uh, come to these meetings and plan it out um stephanie for you as an as an action item for next month if you can and provide us with a summary of the expense spend for the year if you can take that action item okay i'm going to do my best as i said before this is yep. it's new i don't know that i even um I'll do my best. Uh, I just want to say too that um, some of the there's a sustainability budget, but that there may be other projects that don't specifically fall under sustainability, like building related projects that I might not even know about because sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear that what I'll be able to access is really just the sustainability information from that fund account and from that account but it won't necessarily mean that other things aren't happening. Okay. Yeah, I know in the past we've talked about Sean coming and talking to us about it mm -hmm. as well. And I I know he's probably being pulled into multiple meetings as well. Just something to consider as well, Stephanie. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'm going to actually try to meet with him. Um, this, If not by the end of this week, then certainly next week. Okay. Thank I have you. some things to check in about. Okay. And then for our action items, uh, the stretch video, did everybody get a chance to watch the stretch video that uh, uh, Jesse sent up? Okay, I hear, I see some nods. Okay, because we'll be talking about that today. And then uh, Stephanie, I think you have some additional action items here. Anything that you want to talk about or we change the status here um uh do to do, do um so let's see uh the first one i would say ongoing the second one i was actually at the mma conference and spoke to the folks at mass development who are responsible for the pace program and uh the woman i spoke with was wonderful gave me her card and said that all i needed to do is reach out to them and they'd be happy to assist us with um outreach at a chamber breakfast or some other kind of event. So um, they would be willing to give us information if we needed it in terms of successful projects. Okay. Sorry, that was the chamber, of commerce. That was a oh. chamber of commerce meeting, Stephanie? Well, it's kind of both. Um, it's, uh, they could, um, it says discuss su successful projects. We don't have any in town, so it would have to be mm -hmm. from other communities. We don't have them here. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm missing something. You, you there's were two items. There's, there's the first item I said was ongoing. The second item, reach out to Pace. Yeah, that's the one that I was saying I 
ran into someone from the mass development program that oversees the PACE program. Um, and they're willing to work with us and they would be able to give us information about successful projects, as well as come to a chamber breakfast. Um, so it's kind of, Dawn is listed as that next one, but it's kind of both of us were kind of collaborating on that one. Okay. Should, I, I guess, what's what would be the next step here, Stephanie, then? Um, well, I think probably Dawn and I could maybe meet with the woman, the contact from Mass Development. I think that might be helpful in terms of, and also, I mean, I think we need to find out if we can get this as a chamber, um, as we can get this on a chamber breakfast agenda. So that might be something that Dawn would do. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and and the person at the Mass Development Finance Agency, which is essentially the um, financing arm for the PACE program, um, that was a good conversation you said stephanie it was an excellent conversation yeah she was wonderful and they yep i was walking by the booth and they saw my badge and they stopped me <laughs> so <laughs> to have a conversation they were desperate for some conversation because they were kind of at the edge <laughs> so but it was great it was really um fruitful conversation so so Don, have you had a chance to reach out? And, and uh, Laura, I'll, I'll get back to you. I see your hand raised. Uh, uh, Don, did you reach out to the chamber? Um, I, I I didn't. I mean, you know, one of the things that came up actually, thanks to you, Vasu, because I hadn't taken a look at the um, statute um, in a number of months, is the, you know, the changes that are taking place in in the PACE program now because of the August. Um, legislative actions making new construction eligible for pace and in fact massachusetts has out um a what they call a straw proposal as i think you may have seen vasu which is to develop the kind of uh it, to develop the program for new construction um and they're they're their timeline calls for this, uh, the release of the guidelines for, for PACE for new construction to come out this month in February. So there'll be a lot that would need to be added to that discussion um, because in my mind, new construction is a big deal um, as we get a, a lot of new construction or hopefully new construction um, in the town. Uh, to be eligible for the financing. Yeah, definitely a lot going on here. And, and if we're talking about the specialized stretch code today and, and that applies to new construction and significant renovations as well. So we have to see how everything ties in together and what's going to be the conversation that we have and push the town on in a certain direction on. Yeah, and 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 the, yeah. the the proposed pace guidelines for new construction actually reference the stretch codes and you know the um uh, the opt-in specialized energy code. So all of this stuff going on back and forth is is part of the is part of the guidelines for the new construction uh, for pace financing for new construction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I think it it still still shouldn't stop you from having the conversation with um at the chamber breakfast, right? As part of the agenda with them with uh, the businesses, right? That shouldn't stop you, right? So these two actions well, still can coexist with the update in the law. You mean setting up the chamber breakfast, right? Reaching out right. to set up the chamber breakfast. Um, right. I can certainly get back in touch to the um, the the head of the chamber, who, as I said 
a number of months ago I, I met with for an hour or so in, in my office. So I can certainly reach out to her this coming week and I can coordinate with Stephanie on, on what makes the most sense in terms of trying to coordinate setting that up with um you know the mass with, with mass development finance agencies um mm -hmm. uh, availability uh to come be a part of that yeah okay okay and i will i'll reach stephanie i'll i'll be in touch with you over the next day or two to try to move forward on that yeah tomorrow's great if you can Laura, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I just, and maybe we can just add this as an action item for a different meeting, but that I'm, I want to be sure that we're being as, um, protective is not the right word, but that's what's coming to my mind of Stephanie's time as possible. And this action item one, I actually don't know what that data is going to be useful for as written. Um, so I think if we're collecting data, we should make sure that we're going to be able to use it in some way. Um, and I don't think just the number of buildings is going to tell us anything. So um, I just want to flag that. Mm. Yeah, good point, Laura. I do understand we have to be mindful of Stephanie's time. Don, what do you think? Do you think this information will be useful for you? We can get I, I think I think what will be more useful is you know the the fact that Stephanie walked by and and reached out to the mass development people. I, I, to me, that that's the next thing that should happen is trying to coordinate that with a chamber breakfast, whether it's, you know, and we could talk about it because, but, because at that, about that point in time, um, the guidelines should be issued for new construction. There can be a, a, a kind of full-fledged discussion of, of pace financing, what it means, how you go about doing it, what it can be used for, what is required. Um, and and the process too, right, Don? We talked yeah, about and, and the whole, getting involved. The whole process yes. of, of how you do it. And and maybe that makes the most sense. And and maybe Laura's right. Spending a lot of Stephanie's time trying to find out how many, because I mean, that was an issue which popped up when we weren't talking about new construction. We were talking about only stuff that could be renovated or retrofitted. Um, and we thought, gosh, it's a it's a it's a market. We've got to find out what the market is. Um, I, I think opening it up to new construction is going to potentially um, open up a lot more. And, and, and I think that it, it probably would not be the best use of Stephanie's time to try to run down, you know, how many multifamily housing projects and how many commercial buildings we have in the city. Uh, it's not that that wouldn't be important long term, but I think short term, it's, it's the the better use of of Stephanie's the, the the piece of Stephanie's time that can be work with me would be to work on the chamber mass development finance agency, you know, some sort of a breakfast presentation. Okay, Stephanie, you're good with one less action. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled to have one of those. <laughs> you were about to say, Stephanie. No, I was just, I was actually going to say, I, I agreed with that. And I, I, I did want to add that sometimes when we're collecting data too, what I'm finding recently is that it seems like it should be easy to just access certain data. And when we start trying to collect it, it's like going down a rabbit hole. And mm -hmm. even things that I think that we've, already got information on it's proven to be more complicated for instance i'll just throw out the the fleet inventory you know so i just feel like um putting those things down or as agenda and action items seems simple but lately i'm finding that they're actually not they're just huge time sucks some of the things have to happen like the fleet inventory we have to find a way to make that work and maybe it's like things that we need to do better in the future to organize our data um but right now just trying to chase data is not 
it, it is. A, I appreciate that comment, Laura. That was really helpful. And, and that's why we have a we have a data analyst, right? Hopefully this year we can parse through all the data. But yeah, I don't know that we're getting a data analyst. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Laurie, anything on the festival planning? Any new ideas that came up? I got a lot of information and I okay. put it all in a folder and I haven't had a chance to work through it yet. So I don't okay. have anything to add for that this time. Next okay. slide. Okay, thank you. All right, that's all we have for open actions. Let's uh, review and vote on the minutes from the last meeting. Did everybody get a chance to review it? Any comments? No. Laurie, no, okay. I was just gonna move that we accept them as they are. Thank you. I'll second that. Okay. And uh, voice vote in no particular order. Goldner? Yes. D? Yes. Allison? Yes. Raghavan? Yes. Roof? Yes. Breger? Yes. Selman? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Okay. And that's her approved. Okay. Let's uh, open it up to the public for comments. Step. Okay. So we have four members of the public. If anyone is interested in speaking to the ECAC, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, Martha, I've allowed you to speak. You can unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Martha Hanner, speaking as an individual here. I want to thank all your committee for your work on all these different fronts, moving the needle toward renewable energy. However, I would like to comment on one particular point. Last meeting, you spent an hour discussing what is our share of solar installations? How can we maximize our share of solar on our open lands? But I didn't hear any mention or recognition of the equally urgent need to increase our carbon sequestration. You know, climate models are clear that we can't reach our goals and stabilize the climate unless we also greatly increase the amount of CO2 that's annually removed from the atmosphere. This is written throughout the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plans for 2030 and 2050. Uh, in those documents, net zero means that any residual emissions, and we know there will be some, have to be balanced by drawing down an equal amount from the atmosphere each year by our, our forests and soils and wetland and so on. And there's a recent paper by an international team of climate scientists for the, written for the IPCC on the state of carbon dioxide removal that stresses the need that we have to increase the CO2 removal. And so I would sure like to see uh, your committee discussing the difficult challenge of how we balance the real urgent need for solar installations to reduce our fossil fuel use with the equally real urgent need to sequester more carbon in our open lands around Amherst. I mean, that's a challenge to do that balance because there's no good metrics. You know, when you look at an acre of solar panels, you can say, what's the amount of electricity produced? When you look at an acre of woodlands, it's not so easy to give a number to what's its contribution to drawing down CO2. But we're not going to get there from here if we don't focus on both of those aspects. And so I hope that uh, your committee will really try to address both and uh, discuss the balance with our clients here in Western So thank you. Thanks, Martha. And, and very nice to see you on. Uh, Steve? Is it uh, proper to me to pose a question back to Martha? Stephanie? I, I think that's uh, up to you, Vasu as chair. Oh, yeah, completely fine. Okay, then the question I would say, Martha, to you and others is, what sort of land area do you think we need in Amherst as, a, as our fair share of land for sequestration? Um, and what kind of percentage of our land area would be appropriate for that? And I'm not asking you to answer that now, but would love to see a proposal uh, um, and a report perhaps on that. What, what, how much land should we have in Amherst for carbon sequestration? 
and that would very nicely balance what we are what we spent some time on last week looking at how much do we need to meet the renewable energy goals so you're right does those do need to be balanced and both need to be talked about uh, yeah and i'm certainly not not an expert i try to read the literature but uh you know there is this recent report that came out uh, I don't know, two or three months ago that really tries to dig into it. Uh, they talk about potentially new technology for you know, having other chemical means of drawing down CO2, but they also admit that that's not going to get you know, beyond just pilot programs very quickly. And so I don't know, uh, you know who, who would be best to address that. Uh, you know, I agree with you. We, you know, how do we get the metrics? That's, I think, is the challenge, really. Yeah. Laura? Yeah, I was just going to say that I hope Martha can stay for a full meeting because I think the um, graphics that you and Steve worked on actually get to this, right? They show 30% of Amherst land is protected and 10 more percent is um on track as a goal to be protected versus one percent for solar so i think actually this is captured martha quite well um in our work okay well thank you i i i will stay i think you are as i say you're doing a lot of interesting things on a lot of uh different fronts and so i will stay and listen thank you thanks martha is there anyone else who would like to speak? Please electronically raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Looks like no further comment. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the agenda on our solar, solar survey. Um, Stephanie, do you wanna pull up the draft? Sure. Just bear with me. One I know minute. there are a lot of comments. Steve, you had a bunch of comments. Laurie, you did too. Well, I didn't send them in yet, but I have some today. That oh, okay, okay. that would have been. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, if we'll be I'm able sorry. to vote on it. Yeah, but, I. Yeah. Oh, um, I. Sorry, Laurie, but I mean, we're sort of at an eleventh hour with this. Okay. <laughs> so, right. um, I mean, I guess you can send them, and if they're. Uh, the idea was to vote on this today and there's another committee that's viewing this same draft as well yeah that's okay i had sent in some comments on the previous draft but i saw some things in this one that didn't look quite right either so at any rate i'll, I'll mention them but we can proceed and vote and i have no objection okay i'll uh, all right i'm going to share my screen just give me a moment please okay so um not to go through this um Oops, sorry, not to go through this all, um, but I, I did want to say that there, so the comments that were received were from, um, uh, Steve had the most extensive comments, Dwayne also had comments um, that were reviewed and incorporated. I, I want to be clear that the um, consultant did respond to having an introductory um, statement more than a statement, it's pretty much a full page as an introduction to the survey um, that was commented by a few members for both committees. Um, there were comments from the ECAC from Steve and Duane, but also comments from the Solar Bylaw Working Group, Martha Hannah, Hannah and Janet McGowan. And um, a lot of the comments were incorporated into this more recent draft. So um, I'm just going to scroll through. Yeah, I can make a couple of quick comments. I mean, these are relatively small things, but they're still bugging me. Um, shouldn't prevent a vote, I think. If they're minor, if they're really minor, Lori, why don't you just say what they are? If they're really minor, they may be able to be incorporated in. No, they probably won't. But um, I was worried still about the equity thing. Um, they're still in pro at question three. One of the bullets is people are being asked to talk about what possibilities they're most excited about. And the last bullet is equitable solar development and benefits throughout the comp community. And I'm still compared to, it's sort of like the odd man out. It looks very different than all of the other questions in that list. And 
it seems to me that that should be a starting point. Nothing gets done unless it's equitable. So I'm still a little confused as to why that's there. Um, and there were some other just sort of minor things about why not let certain things be open response. And so uh, the open response was because uh, uh, had to do with data. Yeah, I know. And that's why. And there's going to be engage Amherst is going to be a platform that will be open for people to um, provide more comment. So this survey is a piece of a larger process. It's not the entire process. It's kind of just in some ways a beginning and an opportunity to get some feedback. But Engage Amherst will also allow for um, more open-ended comment. And then there's also going to be um, a public meeting as well as two other additional um, sessions that will basically be kind of more drop-ins for people to come in. And um, there'll be sort of uh, ways to engage community members that are more actively um, active sort of engagement yeah. charts and that kind of thing where people can put post-its or you know, expressed interest or dismay or whatever um, that they'll be allowed to to participate in. And it will be a drop-in thing. It won't be like a, those two sessions won't be like specifically just a, a presentation and talking heads. So there's other opportunities for people to provide that type of comment. Okay. And number nine, undeveloped open space. I think it just isn't quite clear what that means. Does that include forest, for example? Is that considered open? Um, so I thought they might want to clarify that bullet a little bit. And I thought number 10 needed a no preference option. It has a no solar development option, but it doesn't have, a, I have no preference because this is the most important thing in the world option. <laughs> I don't care what where they put the solar, right? So that's number 10, sorry. Yeah, number 10 needs a no preference option. Uh, relatively minor stuff. I mean, I'm not gonna vote against it because of that, but I will. If you if you want, I can put this in a note and send it to you, Stephanie. Afterwards, um, it's not too late. Uh, yeah, I think you could do okay. that. I, again, okay. I can't. I mean, I think these are fairly minor that yep. could be. I, I don't know how to address the the equity issue because we've sort of talked about equity as an issue. It's yeah a priority, and we feel like it should be just prioritized as a just should inherently be in the, should be in the <laughs> opening know. statement somewhere. Yeah, maybe then, maybe that's where we could put something about, I'm gonna make a note about that right. piece, right? but I don't think, um, and I think that's a good valid point. Yeah. Thank you. Number, also, um, I realized that number 15 doesn't, there are people around here who live in mobile homes on rented land, and that's not one of the options in that list. Sorry. The demographic questions. Oh, yep. Okay, so just, um, just an other question might be useful. <laughs> other bullet, rather, other choice. Um, well, would I mean maybe you call that a single family house? I uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, to me, a, a mobile home is a single family house. But you own the house, but not planned, so it's a little, uh, yeah, single, maybe just calling it a single family house is fine. Yeah, I kind of feel like that's. Covered. All right. On, on number 15, the only other tiny thing, the, the, the second to last dormitory or student housing, that I assume means on campus student housing. I just hope that would be interpreted as by such that from people taking the survey. Because you could rent a single family house and be a student. So, I, yeah, some students may think they live in student housing because they're living with a bunch of other students. So, right. perhaps mm -hmm. just add on campus in front of student housing. Okay. That's easily done. Good point. Stephanie, can you go to questions 10 and 11? Yes. Steve, did we incorporate the comments that you made? I believe those were questions or nine and 10. I remember. I mean, yeah. Yeah, the, the comments and, and, and questions or concerns that I raised have by and large I've been quite happy with the way they've been incorporated. Uh, can you scroll to 11, please? Yes. Yeah, if we're if we're having the community um, complete this, the second point there, do they know what setbacks mean? Do we need to clarify that? 
Yeah, I, I, this is where I feel like some of the simple language that we had in the beginning <laughs> seemed to me got a little more complicated again. So, um, yeah, I think um, I can. Uh, and again, I think a lot of this was um, accepted language that was proposed by others. So I could um, ask her to somehow find a way to either explain or reword the word setbacks a setback and then in parentheses undeveloped border or undeveloped or decorative border right of some sort oh and after visual screening requirements and Laura, Laura, i think Laura. we're i think we're getting in the weeds here yeah i, I agree <laughs> I, that just got more confusing to me i think we need to accept that this will not be a perfect document yeah we have great resources for people to ask questions Hey, and we could invite the general public to join one of these meetings too if they have questions. Yeah, I agree. And I think setbacks is a term that is specifically used in zoning that I think that's why it's phrased that way. So we probably do want to sort of keep that language. Um, I, I just, I agree though that, I mean, I do sort of see how some of the simple language has gotten more complicated, but I think, you know, hopefully it will um, promote conversation. Laura? Yeah, I completely admit that I have not given time to this, so um, I will accept it as is. But can you remind me what the goal of this is? What's um, the goal of collecting this feedback from the community? This, this was uh, an engagement piece that's part of the solar assessment process. Um, and all of the information, the the um, the point of using the consultant was to have a sort of unbiased, you know, um, unbiased I stop uh, you collection of the data. Sure. Yeah. If it's about the solar assessment, then why are there questions at all about the bylaw? No, because then the information is going to be shared with the solar bylaw working group. So it's kind of it was kind of to cover, <clears throat> you know, the the assessment process and also. Um, to help give provide some information to the solar bylaw working group that might sort of help them in the work that they're doing and to understand some of the community priorities. Okay. I mean, I couldn't answer either of these questions. I don't understand what they mean. So I feel like we're asking questions that are not appropriate to be asked to the general public. And it are, I don't know how we would use the information. I think because it came, I think some of these questions might have also been given by members of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. So I think um, that was to sort of help them. And that's why I'm saying I do think they are getting a little more technical. Uh, at this point, I, you know, we've revised this three times now. And I don't think, I think if there are questions, we're just going to sort of hope that people can sort of do the best that they can and then when we have these information sessions or these, you know, ways to um, engage with us on Engage Amherst and also through the website, that hopefully we can help clarify some of the, the information for people. And I think we want to say, like, so this survey is going to get posted on a website. It's not going to be sort of just a standalone thing. It's going to be sort of part of more information. So I think what we can certainly say is, you know, if you have questions about if the survey prompted questions, we want to encourage people to reach out to us. Yeah, I just think, um, last point, Vasu, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I would prefer that this survey be only about the assessment and not about the bylaw. I think that it, because it's anonymous, we don't know who's responding. And I wouldn't want us to take these answers to these questions and use them as, I, I don't think it, these are, I don't know how general public would be able to answer these questions. So I'm nervous that the that this would create issue. I hear you. Um, I think we're way past the ability to sort of revise this survey that drastically to take out questions pertaining to the bylaw, especially because this was you know both the assessment and the survey were to be just tools 
to maybe help the solar bylaw working group, but they're not in and of themselves. The survey itself is not going to dictate how the bylaw gets developed, right? There are points of conversation. I think there are issues that need to be um, discussed. I think they have to be hashed out. Um, so I think that's part of that is part of the you know, part of the goal of this is to to sort of raise some of those issues. And the Solar Bylog Working Group is going to have to sort of really work on um, having some dialogue around those issues. And Duane, you know, as chair of that committee, can probably speak to that as well. Hey, hey Stephanie, just a point. Maybe, you know, to Laura's point, the public might not know the answer to these, these questions. Does it make sense to add, and I don't know as an option, instead of just a strongly agreed to a strongly sure. disagree? Yep, yeah. I think that's uh, Steve? Good. I just wanted to yeah, echo something that Laura said, that we don't know who's going to be taking this survey. We won't have demographics to know if it's representative of the town. And there's nothing to stop one person from filling it out 10 or 20 times. So, and that we just have to accept that. But we're going to have to make sure when the results are interpreted, they are not interpreted as if this was a vote or a survey that had full and fair um, representation to it. So I'll be really upset if I hear committees or the town council even saying, oh, 55 percent of the people in the survey agreed with blah, 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 blah. It's like that's not a good result. That's not a fair way of interpreting the results. So. Yeah, I kind of agree with Stephanie. This is just one of many different tools. And when you really start poking at it, it's not a very good tool. But still, I think it's a good tool because it will educate people about issues, as well as help the town, different committees get a sense of what people think. Um, but yeah, we're not going to be able to rely on it as if it was a vote. Duane? Yeah, I, I, I just want to echo what um, Steve just said and Laura before him. Uh, from my perspective, from the Solar Bylaw Working Group, um, this this survey is is imprecise. Uh, again, we don't, as uh, Steve pointed out, we don't know exactly who the respondents are, and to the extent to which that will be representative of the full community. And furthermore, it's a set of opinions, uh, and and the bylaw process is more of a legal and regulatory process where opinions can be taken into into account. Uh, but uh, there are rules and regulations with regard to what zoning uh, can and can't do. So that's going to be the driving uh, driving force between between the bylaw. But it 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 will be helpful to the uh, to ECAC as well as the working the uh, bylaw working group to get a, a, a an inaccurate but nonetheless a pulse of of opinions uh, and diversity of opinions um, across the community. But I agree um, without knowing uh, sort of the unless the consultants have some safeguards around this uh, without knowing exactly the makeup of the respondents, except for some of the demographic information to, at the end. Um, it really is not going to be used, in my opinion, from the by the working group with a bylaw working group as a um, pr uh, a precise survey in any way of of preferences around the uh, of the community. Thanks, Wayne. Okay, anything else? Stephanie, I, I don't know if a vote is required, whether you're in favor or not in favor. This it is was still going just to that the right, survey so. is complete. The vote is yeah, more okay. to just say that the survey is complete because yeah. it's not for you to accept it. It's really the town's decision. Agreed. But if you are with these additional edits that you all proposed, if you can just sort of say you feel that the the survey is now complete that would be helpful. I, I could move that, that with this additional notes we've made during this meeting, um, the survey is complete as it is. I, I move that we accept it to be complete. With those. I'll second that. Okay. So a voice vote again, no order. Goldner? Yes. Allison? Yes. Ragaman? Yes. Roof? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Selman? Yes. Drucker? Yes. D? Yes. Okay. Thank you all so much. And thanks for all your input. I think um, 
you know, it certainly changed a lot from the beginning and we appreciate that, you know, all various input from various perspectives strengthened it for sure. And it's not perfect, but it's better than it was. So thank you. Yeah, agreed. And I saw Steve's extensive notes on the survey too. So yeah, thanks a lot, Steve. And he's gone um, when I'm thanking him. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, Don on the PACE flyer. Don, you're on mute. You're still on mute, Don. I seem to have lost your comments, Steve, which were ex extensive and which when I first read them seemed very good. Um, so if you could resend them, that would be great. You're talking about my comments on the pace? Yeah. Okay. If you could resend them to me, that would be great. Um, and I will incorporate them and um the whole, you know, the 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 addition of new construction and the elimination um of uh financing for uh gas line extensions, which were also eliminated from the uh pace um program by the new definition. So, um, and I, I can get that done within, uh, certainly before the next meeting. If you will resend those to me, Steve, I, I, I apologize for losing them. I think I must've CC'd Stephanie on those. So I, I'll find them and, but she may also have them. Yes, yeah, Steve, I was having trouble finding them also. Oh, really? So, oh, okay. Yeah, we can, we can, um connect offline tomorrow about this did okay I'm, yeah, I'm looking now all right so so don you will not have anything to share today is that what you're no. saying no nope. okay anything else in general on paste oh, only what i've already discussed i mean at some point in time i think we have to talk about the um and stephanie and i've talked about it the um uh, the 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 kind of cross fertilization of pace and the whole uh, uh, heat pump program um, and the financing for that. So there's going to be a lot of interface, and I don't know quite how to pull that off right now. But I think I think in today's meeting we've put our finger on, you know moving forward with the chamber to um, get the information out there to uh, to the chamber group. So that's that's all that I have to okay. add. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we'll talk about the solar flyer review, Dwayne, if you want to bring that up. And I think we'll have to talk about the um, updated graphs as well as part of this. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, and I was really happy to see um, Steve's graphics and then I guess the revised graphic, which I think was the same data, just in a different bar chart instead of a circle chart. Uh, uh, but uh, as, as a um, very much complementing um, and reasonably consistent, but I can go through uh, some of the uh, maybe uh, uh, where they differ a bit um, with the um, evaluation that um, I had shared at the last meeting, but then we put that in, and let me acknowledge and thank um, Laura for um, uh, initiating this process of developing a memo and the idea of a memo here from ECAC uh, that would be provided. Um, and maybe Stephanie, do you wanna share the screen on, on the memo uh, that was in the packet, uh, a late entry? Um, the idea here would be a memo uh, getting to somewhat the, the comment that Martha Hanner had earlier and Steve's response to her uh, to provide some of our analysis from ECAC to the Solar Working Bylaw, Solar Bylaw Working Group, um, as well as uh, others in town uh, to begin to try to scope and scale uh, what we as ECAC think would be appropriate um, uh, 
uh, share, as it's being called, of uh, of uh, hosting or siting solar in Amherst uh, to contribute to the state's um, projections. Um, the, it, it, one can question about whether uh, uh, our fair share based on, on land area, which is the way this is uh, presented, is a right metric. Uh, but I think the purpose here is to be to start the conversation and to have some basis for offering our opinions and thoughts and analysis uh, with regard to what are we talking about at this very issue that Steve and Martha were talking about earlier in terms of uh, what is this trade-off uh, and what, at least from ECAC's perspective, do we feel like would be an appropriate window of target, range of, of target uh, for uh, being able to accommodate solar siting on gr uh, ground mounted in Amherst. So this memo um, uh, provides um, an analysis of that, a presentation of that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if people have had a chance to read it ahead of time, but it basically summarizes um, our uh, the results of this analysis uh, and then gives some background uh, to sort of give frame that background. Um, the analysis is based on um, looking at what the what the Commonwealth is projecting uh, for 2050 under in their uh, decarbonization roadmap uh, for the need not for solar in its entirety, but for ground mounted solar uh, after all the all the um, other uh, uh, solar on 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 the built environment is accomplished um, and with substantial efforts to keep that those markets going, what portion of solar um, is expected to be need to find home on uh, on the ground uh, cited on the ground in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, as the illustration provides, there's a range of different scenarios that the decarbonization roadmap um, evaluates um, for uh, for outcomes with regard to uh, how much ground mounted solar is needed. Uh, they range um, in the in these bars here. Uh, the all options scenario is is kind of the base case. Uh, so we we're looking particularly closely at that one. Um, that provides uh, uh, suggests a need of about fifty two thousand acres. Uh, but the error bars there, they're not really error bars. they're they're bars that represent the range of 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 um, uh, uncertainty, if you will, um, as there's lots of moving parts to this modeling that they do. Um, and so that those error bars as as they're represented in the graph, represent the range of uh, acreage, ground mounted acreage under that um, all options um, scenario that would um, likely be needed. Um, the best guess from that scenario is the 50, 52,000 acres. Uh, but then we see from the other scenarios, which are also you know, not, not unlikely and things that we need to uh, potentially plan for, that the range of, um, of land, land, ground mounted acreage for solar across the Commonwealth is ranges between about 35,000 and 125,000 acres. Um, and so what um, the memo uh, uh, puts forward um, and open to discussion on this, uh, I pos uh, suggested that we um, consider a range of 50,000 acres um, to 100,000 acres to cover uh, sort of the most likely range of acreage needed um, for the Commonwealth uh, for ground mounted solar um, across the whole Commonwealth. Um, that represents um, one to 2% of the Commonwealth's land, uh, just for, for, um, for, in, for information. Um, and, um, and so then we looked at, okay, what if we wanna look at our fair share, quote unquote, uh, of, um, of that land in, in, uh, in Amherst, uh, Amherst represents, and this is subtracting uh, the land area of the university and the two colleges, uh, which are apart from our analysis, uh, uh, subtracting out that land area, the, the remaining land area of Amherst is um, um, written here somewhere. I think it's 0.290% uh, of the Commonwealth. 
doing that math, <laughs> it suggests that uh, for Amherst, uh, we should target uh, about, or we should be prepared to offer our fair share, quote unquote. Uh, that would be uh, about 145 to 290 acres of land in Amherst. Um, not surprisingly, because the math <laughs> just works out, uh, that's 1% to 2% of Amherst land. Um, now, uh, with the assumption, which I think is quite reasonable, that um, each megawatt of solar uh, takes up four acres of land, uh, that would also translate to hosting uh, or this land supporting 36 to 72 megawatts of solar uh, DC capacity. Uh, I found that that was useful to put forward uh, because um, we know that we already have ground mounted solar in Amherst of about um, 20 megawatts or roughly 80 acres. Uh, so we have already a decent start uh, in that fair share, if you will, of, of acreage of, of land dedicated to ground-mounted solar. Uh, but the recommendation then uh, from this analysis from and from ECAC, if we decide to move this mo uh, memo forward, uh, would be to uh, put out there uh, that um, uh, that for the purpose of, of uh, um, conversations and discussions in Amherst, as well as consideration for the solar working Solar Bylaw Working Group, um, that as we uh, look at solar zone, uh, zoning, uh, in, uh, solar zoning in in, in uh, Amherst, uh, specifically for ground-mounted solar, that we should try to um, be accommodating uh, of at least sufficient acreage uh, to meet this uh, target um, of, uh, of, of um, ground-mounted solar. Uh, again, uh, that would be uh, the remaining amount, uh, given the fact that we already have about 80 acres of, uh, of solar in Amherst, would be about um, a remaining or about 65 to 200 acres uh, beyond what we've already done. Um, so that's not to say that at all to the work to the solar bylaw working group that we only need to zone this amount of acreage that is eligible for solar because um, uh, because uh, um, many of these pieces of land won't won't uh, uh, care to or decide to be solar farms, but um, uh, but but that we should keep these figures in mind um, as we um, move that process forward. Uh, so that's the um, the intent of the memo. I, I was really um, um, was happy to see Steve's. Um, graphics as well, which I think are are compatible with this. Uh, the only difference is that he um, sort of made the assumption that it's I, th I think sixty five thousand acres uh, for this for the statewide, which was one uh, one number I think for the base uh, for that that base case uh, scenario. Um, I used a range. Um, the sixty five thousand acres, Steve, would be a bit over one percent. Um, the the Commonwealth is remarkably fifty almost precisely 50 million acres um, of, uh, of, uh, of land area. Um, and so 50,000 is, is 1%. Uh, so that, that 65,000 is one point something uh, percent. Uh, but the, 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 the range in these, um, in this uh, decarbonization roadmap uh, and with all the uncertainty about the other sources of, uh, of, um, of renewable energy coming forward and so forth, I thought, ranging that from 1% to 2% would make more sense. Um, so happy to have any comments. Uh, Laura, maybe I ask you, you, you sort of prompted this as well um, and, and, uh, and started the drafting. So if you had anything to add, that would be great. Um, um, but um, otherwise just interested in, in thoughts and comments and whether we wanna move this forward. Yeah, thanks, Laura, for initiating this. And sorry, I didn't respond to you directly uh, when you sent me this. Um, Steve? Well, uh, it, did Laura, did you want to add anything else to Dwayne's overview? No, I think he, I think Dwayne did a great job. All right, well, then I want to thank you guys. I think you did a really nice job of kind of taking the, the mud and confusion we got ourselves into at our last meeting and really simplifying it.
I think Lori suggested to just go with the, the area um, and not try to do the different population estimates. Um, and while I think you know, people are what use energy, not acres of land, um, I, I think it's fine for our purpose here. And so I think this is a great memo, just one or two little picky things I might make some suggestions on, but overall, I'd, I'd love to be able to endorse this as ECAC and send it out to the world who, um, <laughs> who might care about what we have to say. Um, as far as my graphic, I this was prompted by some comments Jesse made, has made several times. Um, you know, we need something simple to kind of show the scale of things. And so that's what I tried to do there. I'm not sure though, after rethinking about it, but for the purposes of this memo, whether we really need to get into the land protection issue um, when we're simply talking about how much ground mount solar we need. Now, Mar Martha's point, maybe, yeah, maybe we do need to bring them both up at the same time. Can so, I, I'm sorry, I, can I interrupt a second? It would be helpful because you all keep referencing the graphic. Oh, um, do we not we... see them? Well, I think it would be helpful to share those. I was sharing the document, yeah. so. Would you um, like you or I can share it's on my screen right now? If you've got it and you can pull it up, that would be great. Yeah. And just an FYI, we have three minutes. Um, oh, well, then let's vote. I, I would say vote for the memo yeah. and we'll use this graphic that I think you can see now. We'll use this in some later conversations. I guess I would be, um, and it doesn't have to be right right away, but uh, this analysis is also helpful to the Solar Bylaw Working Group um, to get this this um, graphic over to them as well. Okay. But maybe we can take that up next meeting, unless we want to go on that too. I'm happy to vote now. If we need someone to move to vote on it, I, I'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess the conversation that we were having, Dwayne, was also as part of the education, uh, you know, with the consultant, we wanted to share something with the community as well, right? And this memo does not do that, right? It, is this, will there be another document that will be prepared for the community that can be shared along with the you know, whatever that the consultant is doing to educate the community on? Yeah, I think two so I things. I have a thought on this, Vasu, which is that if the point of the, and we probably don't have enough time to think about it right now, I would say, yes, there's the potential that we need a memo for the community. If the survey is meant to collect people's thoughts, then coming out with a memo that could be seen as their thoughts don't matter because we already have our opinions. Um, of course, that survey has not, is not for ECAC, but so maybe there is something high level we should be sharing, but I think we, I don't think this, this detailed analysis is what needs to necessarily be shared. Although I could be wrong about that. I just, I'm still a little bit confused by the purpose of the memo, uh, by the survey and the community meetings. So I would need to understand that a little bit better. Yeah, I would just, um, uh, sec second that Th this memo that we're potentially voting on now is not was not written for the community. It was written for town officials, town council, uh, and and yeah. the working group, the solar bylaw working group. Uh, and I, I think in conversations we had in getting to this memo, uh, we did decide to to um, uh, that it may not be appropriate or timely to uh, mm -hmm. bias or anything else, or just give this type of information. To the community before taking the survey. Okay. Well, let's take a vote on it then, and then uh, uh, we have our guest Erin as well. So I'm sorry. Can uh, we have an articulated motion? Because is it to accept? Uh, you know, I need I need a motion to accept the memo. How about this? I move that we send this memo to where does it go? The town council or town to council. the council bylaw working group or. And the the town, town council, the town manager, and the solar bylaw working group. Okay. And just as Steve, you mentioned you might have had a couple uh, thoughts on it. I always appreciate that. If uh, if they're minor, I'm sure I can accommodate those even after a, a vote. Just to, if they're formatted. Steve, if you have comments, we can postpone the vote. 
I, no, you, no serious comments. I think it's yeah. fine as is. It's just like maybe justify how you chose that fifty to one hundred thousand range out of the range that's on the chart. That that's pretty minor. No, okay. nothing significant. Okay. So you have a motion um, on the floor. Golden rule. I'll second it. Okay. And by voice vote, Goldner? Yes. Allison? Yes. Yes. Ragavan? Yes. Roof? Yes. Breger? Yes. Selman? Abstain. D? Yes. Drucker? Yes. All right, thank you, everybody. And uh, welcome, Erin. And Stella, maybe you can give uh, us an introduction. And thank you, Erin, for joining. Um, I think I think Erin's going to pretty much introduce herself, but I'm so excited that she's here. And um, I think it's going to be a great presentation for our first presentation on transit. Stella, um, thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here tonight. Um, Stephanie, am I okay to share my screen over here? Okay, great. Yes. I'm going to share my screen here. Can y'all see a, a slide deck here? Not yet. Let's see. How's that? Yep. yep. Awesome. All right. I'm in with my screen share. Um, y'all have minimized them. So um, if anyone has a hand raised or anything, please feel free to just unmute and, and chime in. Just a um, quick question. We don't need notes on this, right? Uh, minutes on this. This will just be in there as presentation, see the recording, right? Yes, you can, yeah. you can do that. Thanks. Sorry. No worries. All right. Well, um, thanks everyone for having me tonight. Um, as Stella mentioned, my name is Erin Convery, and I am the Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager at the City of Durham in North Carolina. Um, Stella and Stephanie invited me to speak tonight about some of the work we're doing in Durham um, to address climate and equity issues through our transportation planning work. Um, so to get started, um, here's just a brief preview of some of the topics I'll be discussing tonight. Um, we'll start with some introductions, um, then take a dive into some of the uh, exciting new federal funding opportunities that are coming available through the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Durham is approaching these opportunities with a climate and equity lens. And then lastly, um, close out with a couple uh, project case studies and an opportunity for some questions and answers. So um, to start, um, I'll start with an introduction of myself, um, just for a little background. Um, my educational background is in civil and environmental engineering. I spent the early parts of my career uh, working in um, environmental re remediation type work, um, and then went back to school to do my master's in city and regional planning, um, and have been working in the transportation sector since then. Um, I worked for several years as a consultant focused, focused on active transportation, so bicycle and pedestrian focused projects. I've worked at the Regional Transit Agency here in the Triangle area of North Carolina. And as I mentioned um, most recently, I am now with uh, the city of Durham. So we've got a pretty small group here tonight from what I can tell. And what I was hoping we might be able to do is go around and do a quick introduction of ECAC members as well. Um, and if you all wanna share your name and then maybe something transportation related you're interested in, um, just so I can get a feel for kind of where the group's at. Um, and then we'll dive into the presentation. Um, Stella, could I ask you to start introductions and then pass the baton on to another ECAC member? Sure. Uh, my name is Stella D, and I am extremely interested in biking infrastructure because now I use an e-bike as my primary mode of taking my daughter to preschool. Uh, Lori? I'm Lori Goldner. I am particularly interested in, well, I'm also interested in biking. I bike, I would bike everywhere if I didn't have to die or risk dying every time I went out on Pelham Road. Uh, so uh, I'm very interested in biking, but I'm also, my, my 
the thing that's bugging me the most right now is this problem of, of the cost of electricity and how the demand for more electricity, I mean, right now in Amherst, we're paying, some of us are paying up to 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so this is killing us and it's gonna really hurt the whole transition if we can't fix that problem. Um, so I'm interested in how the demand for energy figures into all of this and the demand for electricity in particular. Lori, do you want to keep, keep the baton? Oh, passing? am I supposed to pick someone else? Uh, Dwayne. Great. Hi, uh, Dwayne Breger here. Uh, Aaron, thanks for, for joining us. It's, it's great. Um, uh, in the daytime, I'm the director of the Clean Energy Extension at UMass Amherst. Um, uh, personally, I have an EV for about a year, year and a half now. It's wonderful transportation. Uh, so I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm keen on the uh, EV recharging infrastructure uh, and the um, challenges and progress there. Uh, looking forward a, a decade or two, uh, when we electrify everything, I'm really keen on making use of these uh, mobile uh, energy storage uh, uh, batteries going all around the place uh, to come to UMass and other places of work. And, and uh, instead of charging, they should charge at night uh, and they should come to work and discharge uh, during the daytime. So really keen on trying to um, help uh, figure, figure that out. And I'll pass it on to uh, uh, Vasu. Thanks, Ben, and welcome, Aaron, again, uh, Vasu Raghavan, and uh, interest all the above, plus uh, how do we look at this from an equitable lens as well? And I'll pass it on to Steve. Hi there, I'm Steve Roof. Um, I am a professor of environmental science, geology, climate change researcher at Hampshire College, and I also do a lot of bicycling and find it... Um, both fun and good for commuting. I'm interested in ways that we can actually reduce the miles driven. That's not a big part of our statewide plan. It's more about making the miles driven more efficient, but I think we do need to reduce um, traffic on the roads. And I'm interested in some kind of car share. Like, you know, I would get an electric car, but I just don't drive that much and I wouldn't really realize the benefit. But if I could get an electric car and share it with my neighbors, it would, it would have even greater benefit. So if there's some way to figure out electric car sharing, that'd be a cool thing to do. And um, so that's one of my, one of my thoughts. Thank you. And who's left that hasn't spoken? Has, um, has Jesse spoken? Too much, way, Jesse? In gen in, too much in general, but yes. Um, <laughs> I, I'm very, my name is Jesse Salman. I'm very excited. I've got two kids that are learning how to navigate the world. So I'm excited about solutions that the youth might be involved in and creating new cultural norms where maybe they do not expect to ever own a car. Um, very excited about low tech or no tech solutions where we don't have to actually buy something. In order, and I don't wanna buy our way out of this problem with more things. Um, and just shifting the way we our expectations of how we live our lives and starting with my kids who are excited to get their driver's licenses. Hi, this is Laura. I haven't gone yet. Um, I'm actually in the car right now picking up my daughter. Um, but I interested in everything folks said, definitely interested in how to reduce reliance on cars, particularly in more rural areas, like where we live in Amherst. Um, I did spend a year in the RTP area, so I know that's also a challenge there. So would love, you know, it's bigger. <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of lessons learned there. So looking forward to hearing from you. All right, did, did that cover everyone? No, not me. I'm Don oh. Allison and I'm a lawyer. Um, here in town and have been here in town for a long, long time now. Um, and I, I actually shared Dwayne's uh, interest in, um, in electric charging infrastructure. Um, that, that's my main interest right now. And we have Stephanie. Oh, yep, thank you. Thank you, Vasu. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, you know, especially as a municipality, I'm always interested in hearing what other communities are doing and um, certainly um, how we are going to accommodate the need for more um, charging infrastructure is certainly something I'm interested in, but also, um, you know, ways in which to address equitable issues in terms of transportation and public transportation, I'm very curious about too. Awesome. Hi, Rosie. Um, well, thanks y'all for sharing um, your some of your interests. I think we are gonna cover uh, some of that tonight, some of it we won't, um, but it's really exciting to hear about your kind of broad range of, of interests and questions here. And Laura, I, uh, I don't have it in today's presentation, but um, I can share some um, resources on some micro mobility projects that have been going on um, in RTP and some of our more rural communities here, if you're interested. Um, all right. Hey, Aaron, just a quick note. Uh, sure. Can we stop you and do, in midway through your presentation? How do you want to? Yeah, feel free to chime in. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I set aside some time at the end for question and answers, but, but whatever um, works best for y'all. Okay. I'll look for a raise hands. Thank okay, you. thanks. Masu, your microphone is doing its thing again. <laughs> all right. Um, well, so before our, or I guess to close out introductions, um, I'm also going to provide just kind of a brief introduction to uh, the city of Durham, where, where I'm coming from, uh, to set the scene for some of the work uh, that I'll be talking about tonight. Um, so you can see here, um, I've just pulled for some quick stats and figures, um, but Durham is a mid-sized city in the southeast. Um, we're rapidly growing. We're seeing a lot of population growth, um, but currently have just over about 285,000 uh, residents as of the 2021 American Community Survey. Um, we have several local transit systems. Those include Go Durham, which is our local bus system, and Go Triangle, which is our regional bus system. And then we've got two university transit systems um, through Duke University and NC Central. Um, you can see there, despite those uh, transit services, uh, the vast majority of our commute mode share in Durham is still single occupancy vehicles. Um, so you can see here uh, our biking, walking, and public transportation mode share are collectively just under 6%, so um, still relatively minimal. Um, I also, in preparation for this, wanted to get to know Amherst a little bit. Um, so I've compiled some, some stats here, um, also from the 2021 five-year ACS data and just some, some things online. Um, but as you can see, y'all are blowing us out of the water on some of your mode shares, um, particularly walking. I was very impressed. Um, and then um, as Lori you mentioned, kind of a, we're looking at different, different sizes of communities here, um, different densities, um, and populations, but I do think there are some interesting parallels um, and lessons to be shared between our communities. Um, we're both anchored by educational institutions. Um, just taking a quick look, I think uh, the size of the town of Amherst is actually pretty similarly sized to what we would consider like the greater downtown area of Durham. So there are some parallels there um, that I think um, make some of this relevant. So with, with those introductions behind us, um, I'd just like to take a dive into some of the federal funding opportunities that have become available uh, through both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the more recent Inflation Reduction Act. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, between these two pieces of legislation, we're seeing some of the most significant uh, climate-focused transportation federal funding opportunities that we've seen ever. So um, this is a really exciting time uh, to be working in the transportation sector. Um, so first up, uh, with our bipartisan infrastructure law, which was passed in late 2021, um, this legislation included $1.2 trillion in funding over five years. Um, and of that $1.2 trillion, $550 billion of that was new spending. Um, so as the name implies, a lot of this funding is focused on capital or infrastructure projects, um, which as you can imagine, provide a lot of opportunities for us uh, in transportation. Um, so on this slide, um, this is looking at that subset 
of funding, I mentioned the 550 billion in new spending. Um, so the new dollars cover um, many different types of infrastructure, um, but I've highlighted in these blue boxes, just some of the um, funding sources that are of particular interest from a transportation perspective. Um, the uh, bill or the law included 7.5 million for EV infrastructure, 39 billion for public transit spending, $1 billion for a program called Reconnect Reconnecting Communities, which I'll talk about a little more in a bit. Um, and then 7.5 million in funding for zero and low emission transit vehicles. So on the heels of the IJA, we then had the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so this uh, legislation included historic levels of climate focused investment, um, some of which was particularly focused on the transportation front. Um, so a couple programs of particular interest there were, um, it included funding for rebates for zero emission commercial vehicles. Uh, we see grants to identify low carbon transportation construction materials. Um, they provides funding for technical assistance and capacity building for streamlining the environmental review process for transportation projects, um, which can be quite timely and cumbersome. Um, and then perhaps one of the most well known on the consumer level um, is the $7,500 tax credit for the purchase of electric vehicles. So looking at these two pieces of landmark legislation together, we really see a robust set of funding opportunities available to local, regional and state governments um, to pursue multimodal projects uh, to start to address some of our climate needs. Um, there are honestly too many programs to talk through probably in tonight's presentation. Um, so the four I've starred here um, and that are in bold are programs that are newly created by the recent legislation. So I wanted to provide a little addi additional information on these. Um, first, uh, we've got the Reconnecting Communities program, which I mentioned earlier. So Reconnecting Communities is a program that's aimed at removing, retrofitting, mitigating, or replacing transportation facilities that create barriers. Um, so that can be things like highways or railroad tracks that create barriers to mobility, access, and economic development. Um, so this is a five-year pilot program that was created through the bipartisan infrastructure law um, and has funding set aside for each of those five years. We've got the Street, Safe Streets and Roads for All program, which I always get wrong. Uh, it's a little bit of a tongue twister, um, but it's focused on improving roadway safety uh, with the goal of reducing or eliminating roadway fatalities and serious injuries. Um, so through this program, um, municipalities or um, regional government organizations can uh, apply either for safety action plans or implementation projects. Um, and there is um, some uh, emphasis on safety action plans and implementation projects for disadvantaged communities. Um, the first round of these awards was actually just announced today, um, but it's also expected that this will be an annual program. Oops. Um, another problem, program we've got here, this one's got a clever acronym, the Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Grant Program, otherwise known as SMART. Um, and this program supports uh, projects that use technology to improve transportation safety, efficiency, and accessibility. So some examples of projects that might be eligible for this program include um, coordinated sig signal systems, signal systems that give transit priority, um, projects that support connected vehicles or sensor-based infrastructure, things like that. And then the last program I've got highlighted here um, is from the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which included funding for what they're calling neighborhood access and equity grants. 
Um, and so these grants are aimed at improving community health, connectivity, walkability, and safety near major transportation corridors. So Lori, I didn't catch the name of the road that uh, you see as a barrier to biking, but I would imagine that might be a, a facility that might fall, fall into this category. Um, this um, pot of funding um, also has specifically has $1.2 billion uh, specifically reserved for disadvantaged communities. So you can really see um, through some of this how uh, the administration is um, prioritizing some of its equity goals through how the funding is being allocated. So that was a pretty quick and dirty overview of some of the um, funding opportunities that we're seeing come available. Um, and now what I'm going to take a dive into is how uh, Durham is approaching some of these opportunities. Um, it's a good problem to have. There are a lot of a lot of uh, funding opportunities available, and we have to figure out what makes sense uh, to apply for, how do these uh, programs match our needs, and how can they help us uh, advance our transportation equity and climate goals. So the first step in that process for us was um, getting really clear on what our goals as both as a city and as a transportation department are for um, any of our federal, federally funded projects. Um, so in doing this, we reviewed our city's strategic plan, um, as well as a lot of our own adopted either citywide or transportation focus plans um, and used those to identify some key goals that would guide our pursuit of federal funding. Um, so through that exercise, we developed what we've kind of by shorthand call our three zeros. Um, so that's zero carbon emissions, zero roadway fatalities or serious injuries, and zero disparity in mobility access. Um, so with um, these three goals, we're aligning closely with um, some priorities laid out in some of our existing plan um, plans that includes our carbon neutrality plan, our vision zero policy, and the city's equitable engagement blueprint. And then we've kind of tailored those to reflect some of our transportation needs. So when it comes to zero carbon emissions, from the city's perspective, we're looking to convert our fleet to 100% zero emissions, um, encouraging, oh, I just saw a, a typo on this one, not via clues, vehicles, um, uh, encouraging a shift away from single occupancy vehicles and um, helping uh, develop the local for workforce to operate and maintain zero emission, zero emission vehicles. Um, when we look at zero roadway fatalities or serious, in, or serious injuries, um, we're enhancing safety for all users of our roadway, um, implementing infrastructure to provide safe and reliable travel um, for all modes, and then adopting innovative technology to improve safety as well. And then this last goal focuses on equity, um, zero disparity in mobility access. Um, so this is enhancing access to all, all modes of travel for all people, including people with disabilities, uh, creating multi multimodal improvements to advance the local and regional transit network, um, improving economic opportunities through transportation and workforce development, and enhancing access for Justice 40 communities, which is another um, uh, piece of the current administration's um, transportation priorities. Hey, Aaron, what's your timeline? What's that? Oh, get to it. What's your timeline uh, on your goals there? Sure. So um, with this exercise that we've been looking at, um, we've been focused on a um, not to not necessarily that we'll reach zero emissions, zero fatalities, and zero disparity in access in five years, but we are looking at a five-year vision timeline for our grant pursuit strategy. For um, so, with that in mind, um, we have taken those goals, um, and I let me. I'll hop to the timeline in a sec. Let me talk about this slide real quick. Um, so we've. We've defined those goals 
Um, and another piece of the puzzle for us was to get a full understanding of the universe of projects that we might want to submit for federal funding. Um, so through this exercise, we created a program of projects. Um, it was quite a hefty list. We went through all of our adopted transit plans, our bike ped plan, um, pretty much any transportation related plan that might have a project in it that we might consider for funding, compiled all those, and then we're able to revisit our goals in order to determine which projects within that would be the department's top priorities for federal funding. And some of that was related to goals and then also taking a look at things like cost estimates um, and which projects would be of the magnitude that that federal funding would be really beneficial for us. And so Basu, to get back to your question, um, that's where we started looking at developing that five-year vision for how to align those projects we've identified as high priorities with those um, with all these federal funding uh, opportunities that we're seeing come available. Um, another piece of this puzzle is in addition to figuring out which projects are a good match for which um, programs is also determining which projects um, are ready to be submitted for different programs. Um, so for example, some funding streams are looking for shovel ready projects. So in that case, we'd be looking at projects that have already gone through the planning and design process and are ready to go to construction where other funding sources are available for funding those planning efforts and things like that. So it's kind of been a, a mix and match exercise of trying to figure out how our priorities and which stage our existing projects are in line up well um, with those existing grant opportunities and using that to build out that five-year vision. So now that I've shared some- Sorry, one more question. Oh yeah, Sorry. go ahead. What, what percent of your greenhouse gas emissions is coming from transportation? Um, you know, I don't know that number off the top of my head. I can look that up for you though. Thank you. Yeah, let me jot down some of the things I'm offered to follow up on here so I don't lose track. All right. Um, any other questions before I continue on to the next section? Awesome. All right. Um, so to close out, um, now that I've kind of talked about our, our federal funding approach um, and how we're approaching all these new uh, climate focused federal funding sources. Um, I thought I'd also just share about some of the projects that we're currently working on locally, um, some of which are we are hoping to submit to some of those different federal grant opportunities. Um, I'm calling them case studies here. You could think of this as a section of just projects I'm excited to be working on right now and wanted to share with you all. So I hope you find them interesting as well. Um, so the first effort I'd like to highlight here is our recent uh, 2050 Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, so this is a regionally adopted plan that informs funding for projects that make it into the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, so in looking at um, the Amherst area, I think this would be similar to the Regional Transportation Plan that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission develops. Um, here we call it our, our Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, but this informs our long-term um, transportation priorities for the region. Um, and so in the most recent plan update, which was looking out through the year 2050, um, our, um, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, our MPO, uh, took a pretty visionary approach uh, to how they were looking at the MTP um, that differed pretty significantly to how they have in the past. Um, so historically, our MPO's plan has included roadway widenings, uh, convergence to expressways, um, and different uh, projects uh, meant to address congestion, but that ultimately uh, continue to support single occupancy vehicle travel. Um, so our 
MPO board, which is uh, comprised of elected officials, um, looked at that and realized it didn't align with a lot of their stated policy goals around eliminating fatal crashes, reducing carbon emissions, and making sure everyone has access to affordable transportation. Um, so it was essentially an opportunity to kind of right size these recommendations in order to actually align uh, with, with the board stated goals. Um, and they went ahead and did that. So uh, the 2050 MTP um, eliminated many of the roadway widening recommendations that were previous included in previous versions of the plan and called for more spending on transit, bike lanes, crosswalks, um, and sidewalks. And so this redefining of priorities really does have a significant app impact on what projects um, will get funding in the future um, and therefore which projects will ultimately be implemented. Um, so this represented a real turning point um, about how our region is thinking about and addressing climate change through its transportation policy um, and is kind of an example of how some of that really does start at that policy and prioritization level. Um, the next project I'd like to highlight is a um, recently completed planning effort that our transportation department did called the Better Bus Project. Um, so Better Bus focused on improving transit for Go Durham riders. That's our, excuse me, our local bus system. Um, I know some of y'all mentioned equity as an interest. Um, so Go Durham's ridership consists of 88% people of color. Um, so um, by its very nature, a lot of times when we're doing transit focused projects, um, those are also equity focused projects. Um, and it's a way for us to do some really impactful work to better serve our transportation disadvantaged residents. Um, so this was a pretty comprehensive project that we um, kind of focused on three different areas. So the first was access to transit. Um, I think most of us know most transit trips start as a pedestrian trip. Um, so this is looking at how can we improve people's trip to the bus with things like sidewalks, crosswalks, ADA ramps, things like that. We also looked at bus stop amenities. So things like benches and shelters, um, what are needed and where to provide people with a comfortable, convenient and dignified wait for the bus. And then lastly, we looked at bus speed and reliability. Um, so that's where can we implement things like transit signal priority, which lets buses have a longer green light um, if, if the signal senses them coming, um, pavement marking changes, intersection improvements, and things like that that can help us um, eliminate areas of delay on our bus routes um, so that folks can make their transfers on time and, and get where they need to go on time. So we conducted these analyses uh, system-wide, um, and we also uh, did some uh, specific focus on um, two of our high, highest ridership and highest frequency routes, um, which are on the Holloway and Fayetteville Street corridor. Those are highlighted in the, the top right map there. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out, um, kind of separate from Better Bus, that's been pretty interesting about this is, um, these two routes are also where we're focusing our deployment of our electric buses that we have been able to obtain through some of our federal funding opportunities. Um, so we're able to um, be focusing those buses on those higher frequency routes um, and seeing benefits, you know, air quality, things like that, um, in addition to the um, improvements to the trip to the bus and the trip on the bus um, that was the focus of, of the Better Bus Project. Um, while I'm talking about Better Bus Project, I also wanted to take this opportunity to highlight our Community Partners Program. Um, this is a program that the Transportation Department funds, but is hosted within uh, the city's Neighborhood Improvement Services Department, who does a lot of our day-to-day -day interface with community members. Um, and through this program, um, community organizations are supplied with funding and capacity building opportunities um, that help support their organizations 
while also allowing transportation, our transportation department to invest in long-term in long-term partnerships with these community organizations. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that the transportation planning process is not the easiest to navigate. Um, it's often convoluted and complex. And so this program really helps uh, community organizers who are already really active in their communities, um, especially in our historically black and brown neighborhoods to plug into that process while compensating them for, them for their time and helps uh, create that continuous stream of two-way communication between our residents and the transportation department. So the community partners were a core uh, part of our outreach efforts for the Better Bus Project. Um, and we're very actively involved in shaping the recommendations. Um, and as a result of that, we were really able to build some community trust um, and feel confident that we're providing recommendations that are reflective of the residents along those corridors. Um, so as I just mentioned, um, Lack of trust is something um, about transportation projects is something here in Durham that we, we see a lot in our communities and is frankly uh, well-deserved. Um, the prime example of this in Durham is uh, the Durham Freeway, which uh, was a uh, freeway that was constructed in the 1970s during, during urban renewal um, that cuts through the core of downtown Durham and destroyed many of Durham's black neighborhoods when it was built. Um, so in an effort to address some of these past harms, uh, the city is embarking on an effort to reimagine what that freeway corridor could look like. Um, we're building on the community partner model that I mentioned before um, and partnering with community le leaders in the Haytai neighborhood, um, which you can see here in the image on the top right, that's the Haytai neighborhood in the 1950s before the freeway was constructed. And then you can see in the 1970s, what little was left um, after that freeway construction on the bottom right. So with this project to reimagine the freeway, um, we have some overall uh, goals we're interested in, uh, pursuing biking, walking and transit connections, both along and across the corridor and addressing um, a lot of the environmental justice issues we see with the freeway, such as air quality. Um, but there are many options of what that could look like. Um, it could be looking at something more like a boulevard. It could be something quite ambitious like a cap and cover project. Um, but we are, we are not attempting to come to the community with solutions. Um, with this project, our goal is to what we call is moving at the speed of trust. Um, so we're relying on the community to help guide our vision of the future of the freeway um, before we pursue federal funding. Um, this project we think could be a great fit for some of the opportunities I mentioned earlier, like reconnecting communities or neighborhood equity and access grants. Um, but we really wanna make sure we've got um, community and understanding and buy-in on on how we're moving forward with this one. Um, I know a couple of folks at the beginning um, mentioned uh, interest in bike infrastructure. I did wanna highlight a couple, um, some of our recent uh, bike planning efforts here in Durham. Um, the city has a pretty robust pipeline of locally and federally funded sidewalk trail and bike lane projects. Uh, but one area we've been exploring more recently or had the opportunity to explore more recently um, is taking advantage of existing resurfacing projects to restripe some of our roadways to accommodate um, bike lanes and multimodal facilities. Um, this effort um, has involved a lot of coordination between our department the North Carolina Department of Transportation who owns and maintains many of the roadways in Durham and so is doing a lot of those resurfacings. Um, our local public works department who also um, maintains our, our local streets. And then um, we've even had some opportunity to coordinate with our 
water management folks um, who sometimes are during water line replacements are doing full, full street resurfacings. Um, so we found that these kind of opportunistic bike lane projects um, have been a really efficient and cost-effective way to relatively quickly get um, bike infrastructure on the ground that might otherwise require additional funding or planning efforts. And then lastly, I just wanted to share, um, I guess a more programmatic effort that we've recently wrapped up related to uh, biking in Durham. Um, this was called our Bull e-bike pilot program. Um, I know you all in Amherst have an e-bike share program. Uh, currently, Durham does not have a bike share program, um, but this pilot program um, was exploring um, how we could reduce single occupancy trips um, through through e-bikes. Um, so it was a pilot program that was funded by Bloomberg Phil Philanthropies. And then we also partnered with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, um, for data collection during the pilot program. Um, so during the program, the city loaned out um, individual e-bikes to participants for four weeks at a time. Um, and it was focused uh, particularly on downtown hospitality sector workers who's, um, and the reason that uh, group was chosen as our focus was because a lot of times um, their shifts don't align well with um, some of our transit schedules. So looking at different opportunities or different ways we might support um, mobility to downtown for those workers. Um, and then also particularly focusing on those who are transportation disadvantaged or lower income. Um, so overall, the pilot was really successful um, over the course of the pilot, which just wrapped up in December. Uh, we had 61 participants in seven cohorts um, who took more than 1,100 trips via the e-bikes over the course of that time. Um, and the data shows, um, so the participants recorded purpose of their trip and how they would have gotten there without an e-bike. Um, and so that was part of the data collection, which showed that 38% um, of the trips replaced a drive alone travel trip. Um, so our transportation demand management team is wrapping up reporting on this project, um, but we're pretty excited about uh, the outcomes and now have a fleet of e-bikes that we need to figure out what to do with, which is again, an exciting problem to have. So. Um, with that, I think I've taken up a good bit of time. I was going to show a little testimonial video from that program, but maybe I'll just send the link um, to Stephanie after who can distribute it. And I'll go ahead and just, um, this here is a recent, uh, one of those recent resurfacing projects I mentioned, which um, just uh, got in the vertical delineation just got installed last week. So we're very excited about, um, but with that, I will uh, wrap up. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or my contact information is here. Um, happy to be in touch via email or phone with anyone as well. Erin, thank you so much for doing it, uh, doing this. And I see Laura has her hand raised. So, uh, sure. Laura. Yeah, thanks, Erin. This was super interesting and congrats on all this great work. Um, question that you may or may not have the answer to off the top of your head. Just wondering how much the colleges in Durham contribute to the town, either transportation wise or other through pilot programs or other ways to um, help support some of this, these projects. Yeah, um, I guess one thing that comes to mind there, um, so currently, since the pandemic started, um, Durham has gone fare free on our bus routes. Um, so this is a little bit dated, but prior to that, um, we had a, a go pass system in which employers could um, subsidize their employees transit passes. Um, and I do know that, um, for example, Duke was very involved um, as one of the biggest employers in Durham was very involved in the go pass program. Um, that's a little bit on hiatus because uh, there's no need to pay for transit right now, um, given that we're fare free. Um, 
I'm trying to think of other examples. Um, I, I will say the universities are pretty significant stakeholders in a lot of our projects. Um, actually, this image we're looking at right now is on a roadway that um, follows the edge of Duke's campus. Um, so this is something they were pretty involved in um, from, I guess, just a input uh, and feedback on our recommendations perspective. Um, but I can I can see if I can find some examples of more contra concrete contributions towards transportation projects, if you're interested. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Hey, Stephanie, let's also open it up to the public for questions. Thank you. Sure, if anyone from the public is interested in asking a question, please digitally raise your hand and I'll allow you to speak. Julian, go ahead. You can unmute. Hi, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. My question, two questions, is A, do you have like in Amherst, there are separate ports for bike chargers where you can like charge an electric bike with our e-bike program? Do you guys, how do you set up the ports like that? And my second question is the little pillars I see in the photo. Mm -hmm. How do those get like plowed around? Um, or maybe you guys don't get snow down there. Oh, that's a great question. We do not get snow in the same way you guys do. We get snow maybe about once a year, um, if that, or we get uh, Got it. <laughs> reports that snow might be coming and everything shuts down in anticipation. <laughs> So that's actually I, we've we've switched to the to the North Carolina model. We're only getting snow once a year now. <laughs> Remember yesterday <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I can ask our operations and maintenance folks um, what they how they handle snow when it does snow, but it does not happen enough that I know the answer off the top of my head. <laughs> Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I will also have to because we don't have like a public bike e-bike share program. I don't know about any particular charging stations that are specific to e-bikes or at least public ones. Um, I know in a lot of our city parking garages, we have charging available for, um, you know, for vehicles, but I'm not sure about bike specific charging infrastructure, but that's a great question. That's great, thank you. Sure. Great questions, Julian. Um, and Laura, you have another question? Yeah, if nobody else has a question, sorry. Um, Aaron, you missed, you mentioned the fare free um, bus and I was wondering, I was actually just in a conversation about this hearing about how, um, and I forget where it was, it was tried, but there was some concern from the bus drivers actually that the fare free, um, was was creating more stress and issues for them. I just wondered if if you've had that same experience a lot. I think do it, I think the 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 general consensus was that it's a great idea, but with without uh, addressing some of the problems with um, folks that without without homes, it can create more burden on the bus drivers to sort of act, have to do things outside of their their job descriptions. Yeah, so anecdotally, we have heard some of that as well. Um, we've uh, looked at a couple different um, things um, on that front. Um, I know there was a, a pretty concerted marketing and education campaign that our transit system did around um, kind of courtesy towards bus drivers, um, not just for um, those who are maybe using the bus systems, not, you know, as a, as a place to sit and not necessarily going anywhere, but also just, I think during um, the pandemic in general, we saw a good bit of, you know, bus drivers having to enforce mask mandates and things like that, that were just um, a, a lot more conflict um, directed towards our operators than um, anecdotally there had been in the past. Um, another thing, um, and this isn't transportation specific, but um, Durham has uh, recently 
started a program that's called HEART. Um, it is our version of a non-police response to um, situations that previously police would have been called for um, in situations where you know that that level of response is not necessary. Um, so I know um, our transit operators work closely with the HEART program as, as well um, in, in cases where um, something like that does arise. Um, there's a, an opportunity to address a situation without escalating it like that. Are there any, any other, other questions? questions? What? Oh, Jesse. Yes. What kind of commute or transport do you have, Aaron, in, in, and how would you like to see it change or improve? Sure. I, I either walk or bike into work. Um, I do only go in, I go into City Hall about three days a week. So two days a week, I'm a, I have no commute. Um, but on the days I do go in, I, I either bike or uh, walk. Uh, it's about a 25 minute walk, a little less than 10 minute bike ride. Um, I think there are some opportunities to improve some of the intersections that I walk through on a daily basis. Um, and I also uh, either have to choose a more circuitous route that has existing bike lanes or a more uh, straight shot route that doesn't. So I'd love for someday for the straight shot route to have a bike lane. I can confirm that that's true. She does walk or bike. <laughs> Thank you for matching for me, Stella. Yeah, amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, no thank you again comments. so much for your time, Erin. Really appreciate it. And as we go on this journey, we might pick your brain through Stella. Sure. Uh, yeah, so. I, I'm, Thanks and I'm again. always excited. I'd love to hear, you know, more about uh, the transportation work you all are doing, and. Um, and all the, the other energy related stuff ECAC's doing. So um, please keep me in the loop. And uh, like I said, don't hesitate to reach out if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right, thanks y'all. Thank you. you. You're welcome to stick around Aaron. We have 10 minutes or seven minutes and then we'll wrap up at the meeting. Uh, Sounds good. Jesse. Does it make sense to talk about the stretch code now or should we postpone it to next meeting? I don't have any updates um, that's worth taking time over if Jesse needs the time. Oh, the one update, uh, Stephanie, um, Anna is no longer the liaison uh, for the town council. It's- um, Alicia Walker. Alicia Walker, yeah, thank you. Uh, Steve? Thank you. Just just one update um, reminder. Stephanie sent you all a message uh, Monday this week about the town, the development of the rental bylaw, and that is moving forward. And the CRC hopes to be able to schedule some more public review meetings in February. And their optimistic goal would be to try to get it finalized and over to the town council in March. Now, they, they realize that's an optimistic goal. It may not happen. Um, in the message that Stephanie sent is uh, copied the parts of the rental bylaw that are most of interest to us. And that is the series of questions that would be asked of uh, property owners applying for a rental permit. And then also the requirements uh, for the rental permit uh, with respect to energy efficiency. So those are in the email that Stephanie sent. If you have any comments or questions on those, please send to me and include Stephanie. And I look forward to any feedback you got. I will try to attend those CRC meetings in next month and then report back to you all how those provisions fare. Thanks, Steve. Any other ECAC member updates? No. Jesse, what so, do you think? Sorry. So I don't think we could have a full conversation. I would just say if anyone had any 
if anyone did watch the video and had any specific questions, whether we have time to answer them or not, now might be a good time to ask a question about the process and I could find an answer for next time. Otherwise, I think probably postpone till next time. I did discover one kind of interesting side note, which is I think they're offering up another level on top. So this sort of secret experimental level, which would be a uh, totally fossil fuel free version of net zero, which I'm not sure how you couldn't be fossil fuel free for net zero anyway, but it's kind of, I want to learn a little more about that as well. But so if anyone had a specific question, I could research for next yeah, time. Lori did. To do uh, that. Yeah, my only question, the thing that I'm still trying to figure out, I was going to do this myself, but since you asked, is what are the salient differences between the new uh, zero uh, stretch bylaw and the effort by some municipalities to put in a their own um, uh, what's it called uh, their opt in code? What I can't think of what it's called. This the ten home rules. Home rule. Their home rule petition yeah. with their own code. Um, that are there any, are there any important differences left anymore, especially if there's an even more stringent uh, stretch code that could be adopted? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I will. I've been going to meetings to for both things, and they they're, they're not. <laughs> nobody has has discussed one in the other meeting, right? So I, I'm trying to put it together myself. I'll see what I can find out. It's a good question. Well, grab a sweater. It's going to be cold this weekend. Only Friday night. Only Friday night. That's how we do it now. <laughs> well, we, Saturday we, too. <laughs> and Saturday, but by Sunday, it'll be back up at 38. We're like at Maryland. This is our climate now. <laughs> we'll, we'll be in Durham soon. I can never remember Maryland getting to minus 10 and minus 30 with wind chill, which is what's supposed to happen Friday night. So. Okay, so conversation for next meeting then, Jesse? Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, I think I'd be happy to. I don't, I don't think it's a two minute or. Yeah, agreed. And please make sure you watch the video um, before the meeting. I think I'll just enable the discussion. Uh, what else do we have on the agenda, Stephanie, for our next meeting? Um, well, I think we covered transportation tonight. So normally we would have had transportation. We still could add that. We will and, have C pace and the fire. So we have the C pace, the stretch code, um, heat pumps, built heat pumps, maybe uh, Lori, right? Yeah, heat pumps. If there's more to add by then, I think at this point, it's mostly Stephanie working on it, unless you want me to try to go ahead and put together. Well, I should probably talk with Stephanie about putting together some sort of a panel. We talked about having a panel with people to talk. Yep. About. Right. So maybe right. it's time to start thinking about that again. Yep. Yeah, we do not need more time and we need to send this flyer out. Uh, also, maybe just three, a few four weeks on. in advance if we can. Yep. So more people join. Yep. Also, maybe yeah. just a few uh, minutes on the festival if I manage to pull together a proposal for what we ought to do. So I think okay. it's simple, but if we, that can wait if we don't have time. I think we'll have time next time. Let's add that to the agenda. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so. Okay. Awesome. Well, this was a great discussion, and thank you, Erin, again for joining. Hope you all have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Take care. Bye. Bye.